Uh, we have session number five, that's advanced heart failure, surgical options. It's going to be a pretty interesting uh, session that's been keenly looked forward to right from uh, the day in the morning. Each speaker would have uh, 12 minutes followed by three minutes of discussion. And I request the speakers to kindly pay attention to the timer. That's straight across. Uh, with these few words, may I straight away invite the chairpersons of this session. Uh, please welcome, in the order of appearance, uh, Dr. S. K. Sinha, Director, Cardiothoracic Vascular Surgery, Max Smart Super Specialty Hospital, Saket, New Delhi. Uh, Professor Asif Hussain from Aligarh Muslim University in Aligarh. Deputy Director of the Center for Cardiology and Cardiovascular Research. Uh, Professor Hussain, if you could please join us. Dr. Rajneesh Malhotra, Senior Director, Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery at Max Super Specialty Hospital. Professor Colonel Kumudrai, British Seva Medal, Past President, Vascular Society of India and Director of Vascular Surgery at Max Healthcare. Dr. Anand Kumar Pandey, Director and Unit Head, Interventional Cardiology, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Patpar Ganj, New Delhi. The moderator's panel would comprise of Dr. Dinesh Kumar Mittal, Senior Consultant and Head Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Shalimar Bagh. Dr. Rithik Raj Bhuyan, Principal Consultant and in Charge Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery at Max Super Specialty Hospital, Patpar Ganj. Dr. Arvind Goyal, Senior Consultant, Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgeon, Center for Excellence in Cardiac Surgery at the Paris HMRI Hospital, Patna, Bihar. Dr. Sanjeev Malhotra, Senior Consultant Cardiac Surgeon at the Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Kumar Chan, Chief of Anesthesia, uh, Invasive Pulmonology and Critical Care at Max Super Specialty Hospital in Saket. And Dr. Nagendra Chauhan, Associate Director of Interventional Cardiology at uh, Max Super Specialty. I beg your pardon at Medanta Medicity, Gurkhaan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with these few words, we move on to the first talk straight away. And I have the pleasure for inviting to the next 12 minutes, Padma Shri, Dr. Ganesh Kumar Mani, Chairman, Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket, to speak on surgical revascularization best for left ventricular dysfunction. Dr. Mani, please. Move on to the left. And uh, we will take up the questions immediately for the next three minutes. <coughs> Over to Dr. Mani. Good evening. Chairperson, should I start or? Okay. Please start, sir. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> addressing a house full of cardiologists, uh, talking about surgical revascularization, um, I think um, I try to look up the literature. Um, all all comparisons have always talked about various equality issues between PCI and CABG. But surprisingly, the LV dysfunction has been very low. Like in the awesome trial, only 21% had LVEF below 35, 2% in the syntax trial, and 2.5% in the freedom trial. The Bari trial did have 17.5% patients who had LVEF of less than 50. Now, we don't consider LVEF of 48 or 49 as LV dysfunction. So, then we came to the STITCH trial, and that seems to be most, most relevant because uh, more than 1,000 patients with LVEF of less than 35%. And recently, Dallin, has noted a higher mort mortality in heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, 236 patients vis-a-vis -vis heart failure preserved ejection fraction, 152 patients. Surgical treatment of ischemic heart failure, the STITCH trial, was primarily designed to test two hypotheses, namely, does revascularization by CABG offer more benefit than medical treatment? Question number two, does structural ventricular reconstruction, or SVR, offer more benefit than CABG alone? Subsequently, there have been some analysis of subsets. Does demonstration of viability, there was a discussion on viability in the previous paper. Does viability really matter? And does mitral valve repair improve long-term outcomes? Results of STITCH trial, 
Cabbage provided better quality of life and freedom from repeat hospitalization that was statistically significant. Cabbage and medical treatment did not have statistically different mortality issues. Viability of myocardium surprisingly did not have any impact on survival after cabbage. SVR did not have any impact on long-term outcomes. As a matter of fact, SVR did have an impact on the cost of treatment. This, however, is contrary to earlier authors claiming better prognosis of reduced left ventricular systolic volumes and restoring the elliptical geometry which they believed was very important for good cardiac function. The long-term benefits were charted and as you can see the probability of death from any cause was significantly um, less um, you know, with cabbage and this difference in the two, uh, as you can see the two graphs separating as the time goes on. So at six years it was very different from what they thought in the first year. There are many reasons for um, uh, evaluating um, LV dysfunction, especially if there is hibernating myocardium, myocardial factors, non-myocardial factors, systemic and other factors. They all contribute to left ventricular remodeling, progression of left ventricular systolic dysfunction and heart failure symptoms. As you can see on the graph on the right side, the Duke University which had reported medical treatment being better for the treatment of heart failure later on five years later as you can see the in the uh, the same um, authors they found that five years later uh, the outcomes were much much better with surgery role of mitral valve surgery secondary mitral regurgitation is common in ischemic cardiomyopathy mild to moderate mr may be safely ignored Surgical intervention of mitral valve should be considered only in severe mitral regurgitation where guided medical therapy and CRT are unsuccessful in relieving symptoms. NHLBI CTS network randomized trial for ischemic MR recently reported greater durability of mitral valve replacement vis-a-vis -vis mitral valve repair. This is surprising because initially we were all taught not to replace the mitral valve and do repairs. But this was reported as a surprise and now most of us are going back to replacements than repair because with caudal preservations you can achieve the same results. Percutaneous mitral valve therapies may augment medical therapy and is currently being evaluated, especially the mitral clip. Interoperative TEE is of great value in quantifying MR. I think uh, today cardiac surgery is not complete without a transesophageal echocardiographic evidence. We have had a significant amount of experience in the last 33 years. We started doing bypass surgery in 1984 when Dr. Sinha used to work with me. Um, now we have been doing a lot of off-pump surgery and uh, LV dysfunction we have done about 1500 cases out of which 911 were done off-pump and this is the basis of this talk. Uh, we can't compare unequal numbers, so we took two comparable years of operation uh, which were chosen for analysis, 210 patients operated in Apollo in 1999 and 216 patients in about one year and six months in MaxSmart. The subset analysis, we did the cardiac morbidity, a recent MI, uh, plain balloon angioplasty of culprit artery, severe aortic stenosis, severe MR, post-infarction VSD, they have been charted. Both the numbers were quite comparable with each other. Major comorbidity, they were diabetics who had uncontrolled diabetic, especially HbA1c over nine. Uh, in the earlier group, they were, I mean, all these are quite comparable. So these two series which we picked up randomly uh, 1999 and 2016-17 uh, were quite comparable. Why did we pick up? Uh, because in one we were using complete cardiopulmonary bypass, cardioplegic arrest and in the other one we do almost no, none with uh, bypass and we had done all, them, all of them off pump except when we had to do LV aneurysm repair, mitral valve repair, mitral valve replacement, ventricular septal rupture, aortic valve replacement, 
Double valve well procedure. Hybrid procedure is of value in congestive heart failure. Uh, my former team member, Dr. Suman Bhandari, helped me with um, a patient who had already had an endocardial lead in, in the left ventricle through the coronary sinus. And he says, don't touch for the circumflex, I'll do the circumflex. So put a mammary on and grafted the RCA and he could do the angioplasty of the circumflex. Uh, this patient is still doing very well. There were two of them. Post-operative criteria, morbidity, new intra-aortic balloon pump insertion. That's really not a very successful area because we tried to tend to put the balloon pump as a last measure and that's not a good technique. Prolonged ventilation more than 24 hours. We used to see that more often in cardiopulmonary bypass days. We, we were not doing non-invasive ventilation those days, which we are doing now. And uh, maintenance, dialysis, patients, more patients were readily taken up on, or with this uh, new group. And ICU stay for more than 72 hours was significantly less when we did it off pump. Intractable low cardiac output, um, that is again a very dangerous situation. And when you're operating on heart failure, it can occur. And um, when that occurs, it's a dangerous situation. But the significant thing was all-cause mortality was very, very significantly different from what we had in 1999. Maybe you can blame it on learning curve and so on and so forth. But I will further show you the summary of the observations. Lesser patients in group A had preoperative balloon pump insertion. All patients in group A were done on bypass. Mitral valve replacements, more than um, repairs in the present group. IABP was required earlier in the group A. Out of the new IABP inserted in two cases in group B, there was only one mortality. Uh, that is because we inserted the balloon pump very late. New cerebrovascular accident was almost unknown in this present group. ICU stay beyond 72 hours was more in the previous group. Total mortality was significantly different. Uh, this is a curious uh, benefit of the intraoperative echocardiography. As you can see before, uh, before the op cap, a significant MR. Normally, in the good old days, we would have gone straight away gone for a mitral valve repair for this patient. But um, after the revascularization, the MR had reduced, and we got away without doing anything. Uh, this is, of course, the uh, logic for using um, um, beating heart technique. Uh, reduces systemic inflammatory response, anotropic response, transfusion requirements, neurological complications, renal failure, stress-induced diabetes, and so on and so forth. Drawbacks, of course, we cannot do it in the presence of dangerous arrhythmias, especially uh, if a patient is having ventricular ectopics, multiple ventricular ectopics. Sometimes you can precipitate a ventricular tachycardia and even ventricular fibrillation. Of course, we can shock them and get out of it, but uh, you know, a lot of expertise is required in that. Uh, very big hearts, we find it difficult to uh, stabilize them. So our present technique is to open the right pleura and use a balloon pump all the time. Uh, we have not used cardiopulmonary bypass intentionally uh, to avoid the... Possible reasons for the improved results are chronological later point in the learning curve, simultaneous improvement in anesthesia. And as you can see in this diagram, you know, we try to keep the heart totally in the aerobic environment. And that, as you can see, the aerobic environment produces 36 ATP, whereas the glycolysis produces only 2 A ATP in anaerobic. Whatever may be the myocardial protection techniques, um, you do uh, trigger off a little bit of anaerobic metabolism in the already sick myocardium. Lessons learnt, present uh, experience with CABG for patients with low ejection fraction has been more gratifying. Resemblance to stitch data is coincidental. Preoperative stabilization with intraoperative balloon pump in the cath lab makes operation easier and safer. Off pump strategy appears safer even in low ejection fraction with enlarged hearts. Multidisciplinary approach towards non-cardiac morbidity improves results. Off pump CABG and T evaluation post-operative reduced number of mitral valve repairs. 
Dangerous arrhythmias can be operated with cardiopulmonary bypass without cardioplegic arrest, keeping the my myocardium still in the aerobic metabolism. In situ mitral valve replacement with total cardiac preservation is as good as mitral valve repairs in our hands, except when there is a clot in the large aneurysm and is mobile on TE, present policies to avoid electrical, uh, elective ventricular repairs. Both stitch trial and personal experience suggest substantial benefit of cabbage in severe left ventricular dysfunction. Viability studies are probably not warranted when there are hemodynamically significant coronary artery stenosis. Preoperative use of intraaortic balloon pump improves outcomes and we can still do beating heart surgery without the cardiopulmonary bypass if you have balloon pump properly positioned. I prefer the balloon pump to be positioned in the cath lab because you don't compromise the subclavian outlet, which will compromise the internal mammary flow. We believe that off-pump strategy reduces further ischemic injury to the depressed left ventricle and thereby safer, especially for severe left ventricular dysfunction. Lima usage is beneficial in outcome. Ventricular restoration surgery is indicated only when there is associated VSD or an LV clot. Mitral valve repair was probably overdone in the past, Perhaps off-pump CABG with mitral clip should be the ideal treatment for poor LV with severe MR, the hybrid procedure. We have no experience with mitral clip in our institution as yet. Ejection fraction below 20%, we send them off to Keval Krishan or Rajneesh. Um, bypass surgery is indeed the best for severe left ventricular dysfunction with L Elective intraiotic balloon pump support whenever required. It is, of course, a team effort. I do not take credit for single handedly doing any of these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mani. We have probably time for one question from the chairman. Sir, uh, your results have been really excellent. I mean, they are really inspiring for all of us, and I think maybe to the cardiologists as well that, I mean, in a bad ventricle patients, we can really do. Uh, surgery with very good outcomes. So I just want to ask you, sir, what will be your strategy? Suppose a patient had a bad ventricle, I mean, ejection fraction 35% requiring uh, uh, triple vessel grafts, and has got a mitral regurgitation, which is three plus. So what is your strategy? Whether you're going to tackle that, or do the, I mean, change your strategy, or, or revascularize, or do, I mean, check the mitral. Well, that's, that's a quite common uh, situation. Uh, we revascularize off pump if necessary with balloon pump support. Do a transesophageal echocardiography on in the theater. If the um, MR has come down a degree or two, we quantify the MR by the uh, area of the uh, vena contractor. And if the MR is significant, I would, I would straight away take him immediately on bypass to cardioplegia. By the time you already grafted. So your cardioplegia delivery is much better. And we would do a in situ mitral valve replacement, just taking an ellipse out of the anterior mitral valve and complete caudal preservations. This is the present strategy. I have done all those things. I have done repairs, put in a lot of rings. I think they all deteriorate after some time. And that's what the world experience also is. Okay. That's the time that we have here. Yeah. Any question from the floor? Uh, Dr. Malhotra, we'll take it up sir, combinedly for the uh, interaction from the end. Viability study, sir, even if uh, ECO is showing a lot of echinacea or something. Pardon? You, well, I mean, the documentation, even in the stitch trial, uh, they have looked at viability studies. They think that patients who have got significantly, hemodynamically significantly proximal coronary artery disease, whether they are viable or not viable, they will improve with bypass surgery. This is a learning for me also. I also thought that viability studies was important, but the literature says it is not important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mani. Uh, we'll come back to a combined discussion at the end of all the presentations. With the Thank permission you, of sir. the chair, I'd like to invite Professor Asif Hassan, uh, Deputy Director of Center for Cardiology and Cardiovascular uh, Research at Aligarh Muslim University to please join us. And our second presentation is on treatment options for end-stage heart failure an outlook for left ventricular assistive devices. I'd like to invite Dr. Kabel Krishan, program in charge, heart transplant and ventricular assistive devices, and senior consultant, cardiothoracic and vascular surgeon, 
at Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket. Ladies and gentlemen, for the next 12 minutes, uh, Dr. Krishnan would be in action, and he is also the moderator of the panel discussion at the end of the proceedings. Dr. Krishnan, please. So, can we have uh, Dr. Krishnan's slides? Yes, there we go. So, I'm going to speak on treatment options for end stage heart failure and outlook on ventricular assist devices. So, end stage heart failure is basically when your coronaries are diseased, you go for stenting or bypass surgery. When your valves are diseased, you go for valve replacement or repair. But when, you have, when your muscles, myocardium is diseased, it's maybe systolic or diastolic heart failure. Most of the time, it's a systolic heart failure. When poor ejection fraction with symptomatic patient, then there are only two options left. One is heart transplant, another is ventricular assist devices. So, because this, uh, the NYHA class, everybody is aware of this. NYHA 4 is a very vague term and very broad term. So, the heart, these transplant surgeons and cardiologists, they have divided the NYHA 4 into six intermax levels. Seven is class 3B. So, I'm going li to tell a little bit about this. But the difference between two is if you go in NYHA 1 to 4, the severity of the disease increases. But in intermax, the 1 is the most serious and 7 is the least serious. The first is a critical cardiogenic shock. And all the indications and treatment depends upon which at what stage in which intermax level patient presents to you. First is uh, cardiogenic shock is a crash and burn which you call cord blue. Second is progressive decline on the inotrope. These two kind of patients require emergent ventricular assist device placement, whether it's Centrimag or ECMO. The profile 3 is patient is stable on inotrope, but if you try to wean the inotrope, patient becomes unstable, that is dependent stability. And the frequent flyer, which is a most common presentation, patient comes in acute heart failure, you treat the patient, patient becomes better and you send the patient home and after 3-4 months again comes back. So these patients are frequently coming in and out of the hospital. These two kind of patients require ventricular assist device or if the heart is available, heart transplant. The fifth profile is housebound. They can do activity to an extent, but they, if they go out for shopping or some other job, then they become symptomatic. Class and the sixth profile is walking unit. They can do activity to an extent, but not like a normal patient. These patients can be on transplant list and whenever heart is available, you can transplant the patient. Profile 7 is class 3B symptoms. They are not symptomatic, but they ca if they upgrade it, then you can treat according to the next intermax level. But they don't require any treatment. They just require follow-up. And their survival also depends upon at what intermax level patient comes to you. If they come to as intermax 0 or uh, 1, like dying or crash and burn, then the survival is 0% to class 3B is when 100% one-year survival. So we all are aware this balloon pump supports only 15% of the cardiac output. The tandem heart and impella, they support 30 to 60% of the cardiac output. Levitronics, uh, Centrimax support 100%. But it's an extracorporeal device, can be used only for 14 days to 28 days. HeartMate 2, 3 and HeartWare, they support 100% and they are intracorporeal devices, patient can be sent home. When the patient requires lung or support also, then you can put the ECMO and ECMO is again an extracorporeal support that works only up to a uh, few weeks. And the devices depends upon the, which ventricle you are supporting, left ventricle, right ventricle, or biventricular, or the total artificial heart. Extracorporeal is when the device as a whole is outside the body, away from the patient. Intracorporeal is device is inside the body. Paracorporeal is device, only cannulas go in and device is close to the body. And to total artificial heart is when the heart, uh, this, you take out the uh, native heart and put another heart. It, it depends upon short term or long term support and bridge to recovery, bridge to transplant or bridge to destination therapy. Balloon pump, as I told you that uh, there are uh, short term devices. A biomed, this used to be used uh, till 2006 or 7, but nowadays people don't use it. It's an extracorporeal device. It's only used as a bridge to recovery or bridge to transplant or bridge to another device. Another is Centrimag, since the Centrimag came, the other device, other extracorporeal devices, they were taken back on the seat and then this device, because it's the most promising device so far available as an extracorporeal device. And it gives 5 to 7 liters of flow, easily can be put through the, either through the 
open the chest or through the side and we can put the cannula into the LA or LV and then one other cannula into the aorta. And if you put an oxygenator in that, you can use it as an ACMO also. The another extracorporeal device is ACMO which we use for cardiogenic shock or uh, for any other cardiac postoperative cardiac surgery or they can be used only for the lung also. I'm going to present in the next lecture that one. Tandem heart is uh, like a very simple procedure, a simple technique to use but it's, it requires fluoroscopy and it's used mainly used by the cardiologist for the multi-vessel complex coronary intervention. All these short term devices are either used as a bridge to recovery like the patient, you put the patient on device, patient becomes better and you send the patient home or bridge to decision because these patients when come you don't know their blood pressure is 60, lactate is 15. So you don't know whether they're going to make it or not because these devices can be easily put and they are cheaper than the implantable devices. So it can, it's easy to, uh, once you put this device either ECMO or Centrimag, if the patient makes it then you can go to next level. And if patient doesn't make it, you haven't done much harm on the patient. So, Another is bridge to bridge. If the patient cannot wean off from these devices, you can put in a, in a heart mate 2 or heart mate 3 or heartware. Or you can, if you have heart available, you can do the heart transplant. Uh, the intracorporeal devices, as I told you, they remain in the body and patient can go home. The first device, which in 1991 used to be the XVE, but it's a pulsatile pump and and nowadays only one indication left for this is patient with contraindication to acetrome, otherwise people don't use it because other be uh, better options are available. This is a volume displacement pump, so the failure, it used to work for 18 months to 2 years because it has tissue valves and the valve get damaged within few months, so it, it used to be used as bridge to transplant. And since 2002 this HeartMate 2 came, it's an axial flow continuous pump. So after this device came, people actually started believing that ventricular assist device worked for many years because it was not in the beginning, people thought it as a bridge to transplant, but some patients, those who were on device, they, the patient were offered that heart is available, they didn't come and these, they kept on surviving on these devices and people were surviving for five years, 10 years and then it became a destination therapy. And this is a continuous flow pump, no heart valves, no flexible diaphragm, no large housing, so very small pump. And, but the next generation devices are centrifugal pump, these are called third generation devices. This uh, HeartMate 3 and HeartWare, the HeartMate 3 is fully magnetically levitated and most advanced pump and it has shown so far the most promising results. And the results which it has shown in last two years since it is, uh, it came in 2015 last, so then if the results of this continue for next three, four years become the standard of treatment for, it's uh, comparable to heart transplant. The another is heart where it's a very small, very compact and very easily to insert, very surgeon friendly and it's easy to put in, but uh, it has its own problem, so. The another devices are, they used to come the centrifugal pump like Dura Heart or the Eva Heart or World Heart they are used in certain, um, certain countries, but nowadays not in many countries. So another is uh, MVAD, trial was started, but after 16 months it has to stop because of more thrombosis rate. Jarvik used to be used a lot, but because of its uh, hemolysis, people stopped using it. And Micromac, Debeki, a new, they have come up with uh, some newer versions, but it's still not very uh, promising results. The another device which came as circulite, which is very small, used for a partial support, not for complete support, two to four liters. But because of 16% thrombosis rate, it couldn't uh, get the CE approval, so they had to stop it. The decision is more important than the incision, so the main indications to put a ventricular assist device is cardiogenic shock requiring mechanical assistance, refractory heart failure with continuous inotropic infusion, NYHA class three or four with poor one year survival, progressive symptoms with maximal medical therapy or the uh, severe symptomatic hypertrophic or restrictive cardiomyopathy, life threatening ventricular arrhythmia or hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Because these devices, they be put on the left side and it's a mechanical pump and on the right side it's a native ventricle. So 
you have to optimize the heart before you put the device because the native ventricle and mechanical ventricle, they're not gonna talk to each other. And before the surgery, the cardiac output was two liters. So right ventricle and left ventricle both were giving two, two liters. And now LV, LVAD will give five liters. So right ventricle has to eject five liters. So you have to optimize the ventricle by volume status and other things and then good contractility and inotropes requiring right side support. And to assess all the parameters on TAPSI, uh, on the echo before you go far. Otherwise, you will end up in trouble with the right ventricle when you put the ventricular assist device. So whichever device you put in implantable, the final configuration would, will be like this device, controller, and batteries. And these are the controller batteries. And uh, so far, uh, in Max Hospital, we did a 12 of implantable devices and uh, 10 heart transplant and 57 ECMOs. And this is the ventricle, eight centimeter of the ventricle, which we could put the first patient on LVAD and it's eight, eight, eight centimeter size ventricle, never gonna go normal. So, and once you put the device in, the cardiac output becomes five liters or 5.6 liters. So the, it becomes a normal cardiac output. So the patient gets flow to liver, kidney, all the other organs, and then becomes clinically normal. This is how the drive line comes out, and we fix it with the holster. Because these devices are non-pulsatile, means the pulse pressure is less than 20. So if you see that the arterial line is a trace, uh, trace is close to the straight line. So these, if you take the, if the patient goes outside, they have to take the blood pressure. It has to be taken with the Doppler, not, you cannot measure with the normal sphygmomanometer. And once you put the device, the PA pressure also comes down, PCWP comes down, and patient becomes symptomatically better. Uh, this is a heart mate three pressure curve. It's a different than heart mate two because uh, it's a self-washing uh, uh, effect. And this is how we put the device in. This is a hardware we put on the apex. First we uh, connect the ring and then we cut and then we put the pump in. And then after, after the graft, as we put the RC proximal graft, so. And the heart made three, which I told you, the most promising and most advanced pump so far available. And it has shown a very good results almost no thrombosis and less stroke rates. The, once the patient comes in the ICU, the, the, it's a very intensive monitoring. You can see it's a left-sided monitoring to the LVAD monitor. And then right-sided monitoring is done through the SWAN with the right side monitor in the back. And then the regular monitor, nitric oxide ventilator. So you, in the first few days, you have to optimize the ventricles. That is much more important than device insertion. So. Uh, because the native ventricle and mechanical ventricle has to be optimized. So uh, it's very intensive monitoring required in these patients. So once the patient is extubated, we ask the patient, we put the patient in couch and he, next two days, and you can see that they, this is our one of our patient, uh, this, all these patient on ventricular assist device. People believe that after putting device, people don't work or they do their normal activities. And another patient is, uh, they are dancing. And one of uh, she had her first birthday a few days, two months ago, and uh, this another patient. Uh, they are dancing. The only thing required in ventricular assist device is uh, one drug, which is acetone, because you keep the INR close to 2.5. Unlike in a heart transplant, where you require many medications and their immunosuppression, and uh, the advantage of ventricular assist device over heart transplant is after the age of 65, you don't offer heart transplant. Ventricular assist device is an option up to 92, 95 years. High pulmonary vascular resistance when PVR is more than six, we usually don't offer heart transplant. You can put the ventricular assist device patient within two, three years patients, PVR comes down. It can be used as bridge to candidacy. And even if the patient wants transplant, they can go for transplant. High susceptibility to infection and rejection, which is very, Infection is very common in this country. Overweight patient, uh, above 120 kg, if the patient is there, more likely they would go for heart uh, ventricular assist device because you don't get the donor of similar size. So, uh, 
the uh, problems, uh, there are problems with uh, ventricular assist devices, not without problems. It's like TIA stroke can happen with these devices. There can be hemolysis with the device because these are mechanical pumps and aortic insufficiency can happen after the surgery and right heart failure can happen with the, because you are treating the, you are putting the device in the left ventricle so right failure can happen and this device can get thrombosed also and uh, like this is a heart mid 2 and this is a heart where thrombosis. I'm sorry for the interruption, Dr. Krishnan. And drive line rupture and uh, uh, pump stop. And this is all about. Thank you very much. We probably have time for just one comment or question from the chair for Dr. Krishnan. If there's any. Okay, if there is none, we'll. Yeah, I think. Okay, thank you. Dr. Krishnan, please join the uh, chairperson's group as uh, you've been requested to also moderate the last comments of this session. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Professor Yap Lapor. He is the Chief of Heart Lung Transplant Program and MCS, Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the University Medical Center, Utrecht, from the Netherlands. Uh, Professor Lapor is joining us for the next 12 minutes to speak on HeartMate 3, New Horizon in Left Ventricular Assisted Device, our experience, followed by three minutes of discussion. To help uh, Professor Lepore be on time, we have a timer straight across. May I request him to pay attention? Over to Professor Lepore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I apologize for uh, my voice, but uh, my old one uh, suddenly left me last night. So I hope you uh, will be able to understand everything I say. Um, Are my, is my disclosure. Uh, Dr. Cable already mentioned the HeartMate 3 as the uh, new member of the VET family. Uh, and the first thing you always ask when, uh, when there is a new member is, do we need this? Uh, this? And be especially because the HeartMate 2, the previous uh, uh, pump, is quite uh, successful. It's an actual flow pump, unlike the HeartMate 3, but it's quite successful. It has been implanted in 25,000 patients worldwide so far, and about almost 1,000 publications has been uh, written about uh, this device. The device is very successful. Quality of life with the device is uh, good. And also is survival. Not only is survival uh, significantly better than the old, uh, with the old uh, uh, pulsatile pumps, but over time, you can see here on this uh, slide that then uh, the, the survival increased. With the same pump, uh, survival increased. And it was mainly because we were more confident in using this device in more sick patients. And this is proven, if you see here in the Intermax uh, registry, uh, since the introduction of the HeartMate 2 in 2008 in the United States, less sick patients, the so-called critical, uh, 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 not the critical uh, cardiogenic shock patients, the crash and burning patients were uh, used <coughs> anymore. You see that in 2006 there were, and 2007, almost 50% of patients were crash and burning patients, but since the introduction of the HeartMate 2, it uh, decreased to until 14-15%. Uh, oh, sorry. That confidence in, increased even more in, in such a way that we were uh, implanting, uh, preferably, the, the, this device in patients who were not hospitalized, who were ambulatory at home, the so-called uh, profile, uh, Intermax profile four to seven patients. And even with these patients, you see that the survival and the, in the first, the one year, and the two years of survival were excellent with 80 and 70 percent and statistically significant better than patients who were uh, only uh, medicated. Also with destination therapy patients, you saw that the survival with the heart made too was uh, good with one restriction that was that we in every after one year and every following year, 
we lost 10 to 15% of patients. And in heart transplantation, and you have to remember these are destination patients, so an alternative for heart transplantation. In heart transplantation, uh, the uh, annual uh, loss of patients is only 4 to 5%. And this is all because of the adverse events as shown here. And in assist devices, even the HeartMate 2, are known for their uh, um, adverse events. And you see that after two years, uh, only 20 to 25% never had an adverse event uh, after implantation of a device. And not only that, but over time, uh, the uh, adverse events uh, tend to increase, especially infections and multi-organ uh, failure, and, but the, uh, at the same time, neurological events started to uh, continue uh, over time as well. Well, if you look at the, the roadmap study, uh, the, one of the latest studies, you see that the stroke rate for the ELVAT, uh, and in this regard is the heart mate too, is around 10%. And that, in reality, is a little bit unacceptable, albeit that if you look at the number of uh, patient years, it's only 0.1% uh, 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 episode per patient year. Another problem is pump thrombosis. You see here a couple of uh, examples. And pump thrombosis is an, a problem, uh, especially also for the heart may too, as, as shown here, with a uh, rate of uh, 6.4 percent. Over the years, we were able to reduce pump thrombosis in the heart made too with better implantation techniques and better uh, medical treatment. And it's shown here that in, uh, the pump thrombosis decreased at, when used in the, 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 the adequate uh, technique and the adequate uh, uh, medical therapy, uh, especially anticoagulation, reduced from 8.4% to 2.9%. Using the heart made too in a commercial and not in the study, so later on and, and, uh, in the last couple of years, we did see that the device-related uh, uh, adverse events like infections and also uh, bleeding and stroke did reduce. You see the device-related infections reduced almost by 53%, bleeding by 61%, and stroke by 36%. So is there a need for a new device? And I think yes, and there are a few reasons for it. First of all, this device has been uh, de uh, designed to be more hemocompatible, uh, so to minim by minimizing shear stress minimizing stasis, uh, minimizing flow patterns that activate uh, blood components and minimize interactions between blood and the contacting surfaces. This led, led to a, fr a frictionless design, wide blood flow pa uh, pathways and an intrinsic pulsatility which result, uh, should result in a better blood handling by causing minimal uh, pump thrombosis, a low hemolysis and a reduced blood shearing and stasis. This, the HeartMate 3, is a fully maglev device. That means that you are able to have larger gaps, so there's uh, less shear stress for two uh, the blood components. There is a, the maglev uh, system also allows that you can induce pulsatility, which gives a better washing of uh, the pump. So you can expect that this pump will show less pump thrombosis. There are three studies so far, and they're all short term, three studies uh, of the heart made three. First of all, is the, the largest one, the Momentum 3 trial in the United States. Um, a year ago, or two years ago actually, there was the CE Mark study in Europe, a small study with 50 patients. And at the moment, there is a European study, the Elevate study, uh, of the commercially used uh, devices, uh, device in, in uh, European countries. And you see that survival is excellent at, at six months. It ranged from 86 in the European Elevate study up to 92 in the CE Mark study and 89 in the Momentum 3 trial. This is the Momentum 3 trial. It's a uh, trial 
which uh, with, with three components. The first component has been published, and you see it's a, uh, uh, a randomized uh, trial prospective uh, between the HeartMate 2 and the HeartMate 3. And if you look at the primary endpoint, and the primary endpoint is six month survival free of disabling stroke or reoperation to replace or remove the pump. So it's not overall mortal, uh, survival. And you see that at six months, this uh, endpoint is 86% for the HeartMate uh, 3 and only 77% for the HeartMate 2. And that means that not only the pump is, uh, the HeartMate 3 is uh, not only non-inferior to the HeartMate 2, but is even uh, better than the HeartMate uh, 2. If you look at the suspected of confirmed pump thrombosis, one of the problems of the HeartMate 2, you see that there is no pump thrombosis in the HeartMate 3 until date, and in none of all implanted pumps so far, even outside the study, compared to, in this study, uh, 14 uh, pump thrombosis in the uh, HeartMate 2 uh, group. Another thing is that the pump doesn't show any mal uh, malfunction, as you can see here, and also there is no uh, hemolysis showing that the pump is a really uh, a, a low shear stress pump. At the other hand, however, if you look at the stroke rate, you still see that the stroke rate is uh, around, uh, um, oh wait, I have to go back. The stroke rate is uh, about uh, 8% for the HeartMate 3. And that is still a little bit uh, disappointing as for the HeartMate 2. It's, uh, although it is higher, but we had expected that it would be uh, a little bit uh, lower. And that, uh, as a conclusion for the Momentum 3 trial, we can say there is a significant reduction in the need for reoperation due to pump malfunction of the HeartMate 3 LVAS, but it, there is no suspected or confirmed pump thrombosis events with the HeartMate 3, uh, which is a principal drive for pump exchange. Therefore, they introduced a new study, and it's a new study uh, uh, for the, what they call the HRAA study, the hemocompatibility uh, uh, adverse events uh, study. This is an aggregate of e events, including thromboembolic uh, uh, events and bleeding. So the combination of, uh, of both. And if you look at the result, you see that the event-free, survival-free, uh, freedom of the HRAAE uh, events is 96% uh, and definitely higher than the 55% in the HeartMate 2. So in conclusion from this study, you can say that the superiority of the HeartMate 3 LVET in uh, hemocompatibility related adverse events with 69% of patients surviving free from any hemocompatibility related adverse events at six months compared to 55% of the heart made two. I won't mention the CE mark study, it's a small study, but again, at six months, the primary endpoint for this study uh, was comparable with the predetermined Intermax registered derived performance goal, and it was, was met. Again, there was no suspected uh, or, or confirmed cases of pump thrombosis in the HeartMate 3. And what about the Elevate study? This is a study, an ongoing study at uh, the moment. It, uh, the primary objective of this study is to evaluate adverse events, quality of life, and functional capacity of the HeartMate 3 LVET in, uh, in patients in a real-world uh, post-approval setting. Uh, and as you can see, in contrast to all the, all the other studies, the profile one, the crash and burn in patients, is uh, uh, significantly higher than in the CE mark study. 9% of patients are uh, in profile one, while there were no profile one patients in the CE mark study. And despite this, you see that the uh, survival is at least similar in a, 
and in reality a little bit higher with 92% at uh, six months compared to the CE mark study 86. And there is an, another very positive uh, sign as well as you can see regarding stroke. In the Elevate study, in contrast to the, the stroke rate in the uh, CE mark study, which was 12%, even higher than in the Momentum uh, trial uh, at six months. Now you see that stroke rate in the Elevate study is only 4%, so there is a lot of improvement in this field uh, as well. So the conclusion of the Elevate study so far is that sicker patients treated post-approval uh, post uh, compared to the CE mark study the real world, so uh, not the, the, the study patient, but real world patients, uh, and six month survival is 86%. There is an encouraging low rate of stroke. There's no hemolysis, pump thrombosis, or pump exchange. There is signif a significant improvement in functional status and quality of life scores. And looking forward to report of all the 500, because it's, it's only an intermediate uh, result, uh, for the following six months. Sorry for the interruption, Professor Lepper. I totally run out of time. I'm almost done. <laughs> um, if you compare all three studies, the Momentum 3 trial, the CE Mark study in a European Elevate registry, one remarkable thing occurs. In all studies, there is no, zero pump thrombosis. And this is a very significant uh, uh, improvement of, in the VET uh, business as I, you can say. Uh, it's not only one per, uh, zero percent, but it's until date of all the, uh, the patients, and this is about over two, uh, 2,500 patients, there is no uh, report of any pump thrombosis. So, in conclusion, I could say, yes, we need this new uh, member of the VET uh, family, without any doubt, to uh, compare and make the, the devices comparable to heart transplantation. Thank you. We have probably time for one question for Professor Lepore. Yeah, Professor, what do you think, what is the biggest reason for the least pump thrombosis in this? I mean, in HeartMate 3 as compared to HeartMate 2 and other devices. What is the biggest reason you think is for the least pump thrombosis? In oh, I, 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 the reason is that the design of the pump itself. Because of the MacLev technology, there is a better washing of the pump because you make it pulsatile. And the gaps are wider. I, don't, I didn't show it, but the gaps are 20 uh, times wider than in other uh, uh, centrifugal pumps. And the gaps are constant. So there is no, the, in, in contrast to hydrodynamic uh, pumps, where the gaps are not constant because the lower the speed, the, the smaller the gaps are, and they are 20, 20 times smaller uh, already. So there is less shear stress on the, uh, on the, the blood cells, and there is uh, less uh, uh, activation of, of, uh, of uh, co coagulation uh, components. So, but still the ischemic stroke rate is still higher with the heart with 3A. So the, it's, it's, well, the Elevate study is very promising because you always see that in, in beginning of any device that, that uh, all kind of adverse events is a, a higher percentage than in later when uh, it's uh, used commercially. And uh, so it's not, uh, not super high anymore. The CE mark study was a, was, a, was a disappointment in this regard, but only 50 uh, patients with a stroke rate of 12%. That was unacceptable. But in the Elevate study, it's now already reduced to 4%. So uh, I have a great hope that uh, even the stroke uh, uh, problem will not be solved, but will be uh, diminished. Thank you. So in your opinion, sh should we be using HeartMate 3 as a, I mean, I would say at present date in time, a device for a choice? What is your opinion? Because I think you have, uh, uh, you have deployed the maximum number of HeartMate 3 in the world. Well, so it, de it depends on wh where you use it for either bridge or transplant or destination. If you use it for destination, without any doubt, you should use the heart, uh, heart made tree nowadays because of, of you will uh, encounter less adverse events and a better survival and a better uh, uh, event-free uh, survival. 
Uh, for bridge to transplantation, it depends on, on the availability in each country of donor hearts. If you, uh, for instance, in Holland, we have to wait, the average time to, for, to wait for a heart transplant is two years. Thank and that you. is unacceptable. So all these patients uh, definitely won't uh, survive. But if you have a, uh, the situation that the, uh, your average wait is two or three months, uh, then uh, you, I should definitely opt for a heart made too still. Okay, thank you, Professor Lepo. It's thank all you, the sir. time that we have. Uh, we move on with the permission of the chair to the next lecture. It's in the loan of ECHO in heart transplant and left ventricular assisted device. I'd like to invite Dr. Ajay Arvind, consultant in cardiac anesthesia and critical care at Fortis Muller Hospital from Chennai. He'll be speaking for 12 minutes, followed by three minutes of discussion. To help Dr. Arvind be on time, we have a time straight across. May I request him to kindly be here? Dr. Uh, he is stepping in place of Dr. Suresh Rao, who couldn't make it up due to some last minute exigencies. Good afternoon. I am representing my chief, Dr. Suresh Rao, and my team. And it is my privilege to speak here on this August audience. Uh, heart failure, I will not go too much, but ECHO is an important tool in management of heart failure, both in the preoperative assessment of a recipient, a donor, as well as transplant and LVAD management. And I'll go to ECHO in transplant briefly and concentrate more on LVAD because that needs more time. Okay, what do we do for a recipient? A diagnosis, uh, usually patients are referred to us by the cardiologist, but our ECHOs are done by us usually, always, I mean, and we diagnosis the decision making based on the ECHO finding, the clinical picture of the patient, as well as based on the cat, the right heart cat. Whether it's medical management, whether it is a transplant, whether it is a LVAD is a better option or just follow up. The RV function determines the decision making significantly because a good RV function you can offer an LVAD or a transplant. If you have borderline RV function, a transplant is a better option. Regarding a transplant suitability, the right heart cath is more critical. A PBR above 4, 4.5, you have to be very careful doing a transplant because you end up with post-op RV dysfunction which is very difficult to manage. I will show you some videos of that. Then, role of follow-up patients who are post-transplant, post vad without echo, you cannot manage. Every follow-up, echo is done. Optimization of a recipient who is admitted in hospital on inotropes, increased diuretics, RV, it's no study looking at RV function and essentially the heart itself and the patient's symptomatology. So, echo is important in a transplant recipient either at decision making as well as at pre-optimization stage. A donor evaluation. Uh, in this case, uh, when we go for a hospital for evaluating a donor, ours is a small place, we usually go outside to get donors. So we have a transthoracic echo as well as a TE done. TE done almost always, if not available, a transthoracic echo. And once we have, pa uh, I'll go ahead, have a look at the patient, go through the file, get the echo machine ready, have a look at the echo. If the echo is good, you are fine. You can take the heart if it's allotted to you. If the echo is poor, you would try to consider giving it up. At the same time, if it's a borderline echo, what do you do? Optimization of a donor. In this case, you start some inotrope. I prefer dobutamine, sometimes adrenaline, because most patients in the donor hospitals will be on high doses of NORAD and vasopressin. Definitely, you'll have some LV dysfunction because of the inotropes, the vasopressors presumably, with high pressures. We get the pressures down to more reasonable levels and start some dobutamine, then reassess about 15, half an hour later, and then heart is usually gets better. Reasonably good heart, we would consider taking it. Mild TR, mild MR, not a problem. EF 45 to 50% is fine. Okay, and donor maintenance is just to make sure that the donor after, suppose there's a delay from liver team, we'll wait for a few hours, six, eight, 10, 12 hours, you reassess the echo, make sure the heart is still okay before you go ahead and accept the heart for a recipient. And after this is, after anastomosis, um, surgical part is done and after that, We'll basically look at the heart, we look at all the anastomosis, SVC, IVC here, IOTA, PA, and make sure that there is no gradients, no significant gradients across it. Sometimes there's some side mismatch, surgeons will decide that is the best we can do, so we would leave it as that. So echo after coming off bypass, just to assess the function as well as the, all the uh, anastomosis. This is what heart looks like after coming off bypass, in an ideal case, excellent biomedical function. Echo windows may not be great even in TE because the heart is small and the cavity is big. This is what we hope to see. A significant problem. We, we do a lot of high PBR patients with borderline 
operability. Secondary to pH, or you have primary graft dysfunction, you would have RV dysfunction. You have to optimize inotropes. All our patients come off bypass with nitric oxide. The role of RVAD or ECMO, ECMO sometimes we put, RVAD is more difficult, I suppose, technically, and more challenging. Sometimes we put an ECMO, post bypass, for a day or two, then try to win off the ECMO. But RV dysfunction is a problem. So you have to basically balance that in transplant, that the recipient and donor are mismatch is not there, Echo function reasonably good, even a good donor heart may not work in a high PVR patient. This is what we sometimes get. This is a one year old child, the smallest child we have done. This is severe RV dysfunction. This child was very sick for a few days. Just sat on him, inotropes, high supports, just opened for some time, closed, and then the heart became like this. Child three years later is running around. But all of them don't make it, some of them do. I mean, lose patients occasionally. So that's the role of a echo in a transplant. It is basically pre-op recipient, intra-op assessment, and post-op follow-up. I'll come to the main thing because a VAD echo role is more significant for LVAD, both in the pre-bypass stage, in deciding suitability for a VAD, as well as the post-bypass stage. In a VAD, the RV function is critical, and a detailed RV assessment has to be done. We usually do it, we may do a TE, certainly multiple transverse windows are done. Usually we consult and cardiologists also will be involved in this process to decide the suitability of that. And the patient is given the options and then he takes a decision. Already this slides have been shown, I will not go through in detail. This is the, the LVAD, the HeartMate. This is the hardware device. We have done about 10 hardwares, 3 or 4 HeartMate 2s and 1 HeartMate 3 recently. Okay, in a VAD, in emergency settings, we may not have time, you may have poor images, poor time. You have to look at the LV ejection fraction in a VAD to see the LV function. Uh, usually VAD we put below 25-30% only. LV dimensions important, if you have restrictive cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic, VAD suitability is questionable. Recommendations to have 63 millimeter LV IDD. Any intracardiac thrombi to be categorized, to be, surgeons should be aware where they are, are they mobile, what is to be done for them. Not a contraction surgery, you have to be careful with them. After, after let's see how, how the ventricle is unloaded, the site of cannulation has been decided. You can see a thrombus here, not a contraindication, but there is a risk of stroke. The surgeon on table will try to take off the, con the clot if possible. Cannulation has to be decided on table in conjunction with the surgeons. RV function. Uh, if your CVP on a right heart cat is below 12, you're probably okay. 18, you're probably not okay. The borderline is between the two. Assess the RV function in total. Look at your patient overall condition. Optimize the patient. Diarrhea him nicely. Get him negative. Get him dry. Reassess. Repeat a cat if required. Repeat an echo. And after that, using left side parameters, right side parameters, when you get put a VAD in, your LV EDP comes down, your LA pressures come down, the logic is that the RE function will improve. That is the hope. Some of the times it doesn't work that way. Okay, this is the, for the VAD, what is to be done if you're putting a VAD? Assuming that you accept a patient for a VAD, mitral stenosis, it has to be corrected. Anything more than mild has to be corrected. MR can be left alone. Usually it improves once a VAD is put in. This MR you can leave absolutely alone. If you are correcting a mitral stenosis, the recommendation is to put a, a biopositive back. Significant AR is a problem. It forms a brile loop. Assessment of AR because the high LVDP may not be accurately assessed, will be under assessed, underestimated. So the recommendation is to have vena contracta less than three. Three or more than three, consider tackling the aortic valve. If you have the jet width more than 46%, say more than 50% roughly, guidelines say 46%. Then if you have a jet width more than 50 percent, then you should not, you should not, you should handle that valve, you should tackle the valve. Either sew it off or replace it with a bioprosthetic aortic valve. If you leave AR in a VAD, it will increase and it will give trouble. Final decision is the surgeons, but the images are clear, this is moderate to severe and we would not leave it alone. It has to be handled. AS, you can just probably leave it alone. Only problem is, in case the thrum pump fails with severe AS, there will be no form of cardiac output even if the LV function is present. This is probably the best to be left alone. TR, recommendations to repair the TR if it is anything more than mild, to prevent RV dysfunction. Even PR is an indicator of RV dysfunction, but you can't really do much about it. P 
PFO has to be checked, PFO has to be closed. Any ventricle septal rupture, VSR has to be tackled, otherwise you'll have desaturation and possible air into the left side of the heart. PFOs are unmasked sometimes when the VAD is put on because the RA pressure goes up, the right to left shunting starts. So as you can see with the bubble test, we can make out there's no PFO here in this case. Then the cannulation strikes, as I said, to look for the aneurysm, thrombus, size of the cavity, it's not big. This is the aortic aorta, cannulated aorta, to look at the aorta. In any doubt, it is recommended to have a CT angiogram of the aorta pre-hop to assess the aortic condition for cannulation. Post bypass, de-airing of the left side chambers, the echo is very important to make sure the de-airing is complete. The position of the inflow cannula and the outflow graft the flows into the inflow cannula and the outflow graph can be visualized. In a heart where it cannot be visualized because the pump interferes with the uh, Doppler, but in the heart made too it is possible. Then you optimize the pump speed and manage RV function. So the septum is in the midline. If you have too high pump speeds, it collapses, you have a suction event. If your pump speeds are inadequate, then obviously the valve is not doing the job. So <coughs> other thing is you may have RCA which is anterior, air goes in, you have RV dysfunction, just Stay on bypass, support, usually it settles. And look for AR, any new AR. You should be watchful of AR. This is the VAD after implantation. Okay, now we have RV dysfunction. Causes of RV dysfunction post VAD, air embolism, volume overloaded, bypass, pH. VSS RV function, management. Inotropes and nitric oxide, basically. And if required, post bypass, go back on bypass, consider putting an r support if required. This is the position of the inflow cannula. Echo is vital. It has to be positioned facing the mitral valve. Maybe little angle to the septum is okay. No, she won't ha should not have any obstructions and should not be in contact with any apparatus or the septum. This is pretty well positioned. This is a heart made to cannula. And this is the 3D image. Outflow graph, the proximal part is difficult to imagine and the distal part can be seen. And this is the upper acyclical view, it's a little difficult to get. You get try to get low velocity flows. As you can see, this is the outflow graft. This is the flow of the outflow graft. What is seen in that yellow is the outflow graft flow. And the fl velocities are here. Inflow velocity recommended is less than 1.5 meters per second. Outflow velocity, I couldn't get a recommendation specifically. And then optimizing the pump speed so that the internal septum is to the midline or slightly to the right. What is recommended is to have intermittent opening of the aortic valve so that there is no uh, stasis of blood and forming of clot and AR. So you optimize the pump speed so the RV is not strained, works well, in fact supported, as well as the aortic valve opens intermittently. These things have to be done in the post-op setting also, even before discharge. You can set the pump speeds according to the echo management. It's transfer here. Sorry for the interruption, Dr. Arvind. You are just stepping the time. This is the echoes of showing the septum in the midline. We just go through it quickly. I'm almost done. And one more image. This is showing suction unit. Okay, so to troubleshoot an LVAD, uh, there's no pulse. Pulse oximeter won't sense. NIVP is not readable. And alarms issues. Echo is absolutely a must. You have to have echo in a VAD, more so than a transplant. Without an echo management or echo knowledge, you cannot handle a VAD patient at all. These are the guidelines for echo in the management of LVAD. This is 2015 guidelines. Quite detailed, about 60 pages is there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. Uh, over to the chairperson, if there are any questions. Thank you very much for coming in. Actually, at this last moment, Dr. Suresh, I've told he's going to Hong Kong. And so, thank you. Thanks yes, for sir. coming in. So, uh, do you go with the T probe to the transplant donor heart? And do, do, yes. is there any problem with the PND Act? Sir? Is there any problem with the PND Act when you go to another state? No, no, no. Or we, uh, they, go don't, they don't ask. We, go, we carry our T probe everywhere and a bronchoscope everywhere. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you take the machine out for echo, they will have some problem with that. Usually the donor hospital also cooperates. No, no, but Sometimes when you go to another state, then it's a problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arvind. Ladies and gentlemen, may now have the pleasure of inviting the organizing secretary of the National Heart Failure Summit, Dr. Rajesh Malhotra,
please step forward for the next 12 minutes to speak on cardiac transplant selection criteria and perioperative management for the next 12 minutes, followed by three minutes of discussion. Dr. Malhotra. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I think there is no uh, heart failure meet or uh, conference complete without a talk about the heart transplant. So next 10 minutes or so, I will be just talking about the heart transplant and what is the selection criteria and the management of the patients of heart transplant. As we understand the heart failure, and I think the, this audience really does not need, but let, to, uh, let me re-emphasize on that. The heart failure means the patient who is uh, after the optimum maximal therapy still having symptoms of dyspnea, fatigue, and, and organ hyperperfusion. And these patients on, after maximum therapy are symptomatic. These patients are considered to be the patients in advanced heart failure. And as we still know, as, uh, even at present date and time, heart transplant remains the best treatment for advanced heart failure. Despite the fact that we have got multiple ventricular assist devices available to us, the medical therapy is available to us, but still heart transplant is the best long-term outcome if we are looking for the patients who have got advanced heart failure. And if we look at the survival, at one year the survival is 95%, at five years, 80 percent, and uh, 10 years survival is almost 70 percent. And the results have remained consistent over the period of time. And now we have got better immunosuppression drugs, so even we have got better results than what we used to have. So what are the indications in the patient who, I mean, uh, who require cardiac transplant? The class one indication or the classical indications for the patient who have got advanced heart failure the patients who are in cardiogenic shock requiring mechanical assistance, whether it is the patient on an intraortic balloon requiring mechanical assistance and not able to maintain on that, or patient on a ventricular assist device where we have put this as a bridge to transplant and on LVAD we are not able to maintain the hemodynamics. That patient remains, uh, becomes the candidate for heart transplant. Patient who has got refractory heart failure with continuous inotropic support patient with in functional class 3 and 4, and we were talking about the intermax class. So intermax class uh, patients who are symptomatic really require a heart transplant. Progressive symptoms on maximum therapy, severely symptomatic patient who are having hypertrophic or restrictive cardiomyopathy, and medical restricted angina, patients who are already, I mean, have got no coronary arteries, or the patient who have already received uh, I would say a bypass operation and then require they are refractory still having angina or having symptoms become a candidate for heart transplant. In fact, our last patient what we did was a patient who has already got a coronary bypass done and the patient was symptomatic with a very large heart with 20% ejection fraction In that patient we did a heart transplant. So patient I would say it, after any kind of a disease whether it is a coronary disease or valvular disease or congenital heart disease. If the patient is symptomatic and not getting relief, becomes a candidate for heart transplant. And uh, the, the last, just to complete the list, is cardiac tumors with uh, least likelihood of the metastasis and hypo hypoplastic left heart in congenital uh, heart disease patients required cardiac transplant. And as I said, we should have already exhausted the medical, uh, maximum medical therapy and, and should have explored about the other possibilities of doing a coronary bypass or a valve replacement or a repair and other therapies we should have really looked into and should have found that these therapies are ineffective and these patients become candidate for heart transplant. And we have to look for VO2, which is uh, maximum. Uh, the VO2 should be less than 10 and if the uh, Vmax is less than 10, these patients would have the best outcome after the cardiac transplant. And in, in order to prepare these patients for transplant, we have to do right and left cardiac cath, and we have to look for the VO2 max, and the, all the labs have to be done, including the hepatitis status and HIV status of all these patients, and patients' routine x-rays, pulmonary function test, ECG, and we have to um, do and we have to be very careful about the history, about the patient's drug abuse. 
because uh, such patients we really don't want to take up for the transplant, although they are not contraindicated, but these patients require uh, a post-operatively, maybe, a, I mean, I would see a challenge to manage these patients. And patients' mental and social status, financial support, because these patients require immunosuppression, and if they don't, are not able to have a means to support the immunosuppression in the post-operative period. So these patients should not be considered for a heart transplant. And weight should not be more than 140% of the ideal body weight. And we have to, once we have I mean, met all these criteria, we have to see the brain death. Now, there is ideally a brain death committee in most of the hospitals where we I mean, take the uh, heart from. And the uh, brain death criteria should be met that the patient, uh, the cerebral function should be absent and even the brain stem reflexes should be absent in these patients and should have met the apnea criteria and should be taken for, uh, for the heart transplant. And ABO in, uh, compatibility should be matched. The donor weight should not be uh, uh, more than, I would say, 25% either ways. Means like 20, uh, it should be within 75% uh, to 125% of the, of the recipient. Uh, or, or sorry, of the, uh, of the recipient, yes. And uh, the PRA should be, uh, uh, should be less than um, 10. And if we have to, uh, uh, the PRA is more, then we have to really consider that whether we should be doing or taking that heart for a transplant if the PRA is more than 10, or oh, sorry, 20. So in a typical patient, this is the first patient what, where we did the heart transplant. And most of our patients, have all, all, all had an almost similar kind of a story. So this is a 48 year, 42 years old gentleman who presented with the symptoms of heart failure. And uh, he had been on, off and on, on I mean, getting admitted to the hospital and was being evaluated for uh, acute heart failure many times and was in cardiogenic shock and was uh, diagnosed to have a dilated cardiomyopathy with severe left ventricular dysfunction. So patient was seen uh, in December 2014 and was being uh, seen by us and we did all the studies as I just mentioned to see the pulmonary vascular resistance, the systemic vascular resistance and when we found that this patient is suitable for heart transplant, we listed that patient for heart transplant and, uh, and we got a, uh, fortunately for the patient, got a call from another hospital where I mean the donor was available, and uh, when we got a call from for the uh, availability of the heart, our team went in there and assessed the patient, uh, the donor, and we when we found it to be suitable, we took the heart and uh, we did run all the investigations, and uh, when all the investigations were found to be optimal, and that heart was taken for for a transplant. And that was, uh, I mean, a kind of a news for us, as well as in the city newspapers, we found that, I mean, that heart was traveled 20 kilometers in 16 minutes. And that was kind of a challenge for us to bring the heart within time so that we can complete the operation within the stipulated time of four hours and uh, make it a successful heart transplant. And uh, fortunately for us and the patient, the patient did very well after in the post-operative period. And the patient was extubated first post-op day, mobilized and was out of bed second day. And uh, all the lines and everything was removed the, the next day. And he was started on the immunosuppression, uh, tacrolimus and uh, mycophenolate and methylprednisolone as we do in all our patients. And within a week, the patient was being discharged from our hospital. And this was our first patient. And this is the team which first undertook this first bypass, or sorry, first heart transplant in our hospital. As I said, I mean, the long-term results of transplant are the best. If we look at the 10-year uh, survival rate, it is close to 60 to 70 percent, which even today remains uh, very, high, very good. And the results are but limited by, or the transplant program is still limited by the lack of donors and problem of immunosuppression and the, these patients have got uh, accelerated coronary atheroma in, uh, in their coronary arteries and these patients have a challenge of early as well as the late rejection and the, uh, they are susceptible for more infection because of the 
immunosuppression and more chances of uh, uh, malignancies in the past. So as in the post-operative period, we uh, have this, uh, give these patients uh, cyclosporins and tacrolimus and uh, in conjunction with other drugs. And these adjunctive therapies, is these patients are mycophenolate and the supportive prednisolone is given to all the patients. And statins have been found to have a very good results in the post-operative period. So all these therapies are, are followed in almost all the patients and we follow this protocol. So as I said, the early as well as the late rejection remains a challenge for all, all across the world, not for us in a heart transplant patient. And we have to follow this uh, with repeated uh, endomyocardial biopsies which are being done by our cardiologist and we do that to look for early rejection as well as uh, the late rejections. So this is a microtome or a, for the biopsy and from which I mean, we repeatedly, repeatedly take uh, biopsies to see whether the patient is having a delayed rejection or not. And these are the uh, different grades of, I would say, rejection as we can uh, really find out and do that and, uh, and uh, take the remedial measures. So another problem, as I said, was a cardiac uh, graft vasculopathy. This is exactly what we see. If we take a, a coronary a cross section of the coronary arteries, these patients develop vasculopathy because in a regular patient where we see uh, atherosclerosis, we have I mean, the areas where we can find normal coronary artery where we can do a bypass. Here we find the coronary arteries are atherosclerotic or I mean, they have hypertrophy of the intima all across the coronary. And that patient, if this patient develops this, requires another, another transplant. I mean, uh, these patients are not amenable for a bypass operation. So I will end my talk with this small movie, which tells about the story about the first transplant which was being done in our hospital. And the story remains almost the same. It's very dramatic. It's really, I mean, I would say very good when we do this, we start this, and when we have been able to I mean, complete this, it really is a very overwhelming for the whole I mean, institution as well as the whole team, which works really hard for successful completion of this. Dr. Kewal is leading the program here with us, and he has been, I would say, compliment him. He has been really very energetic, very proactive towards this whole program, and he has been spearheading this. So this is the first transplant which was being done in our hospital, and this is the small movie, about one minute, which shows about this. So as you see, I mean, we take the heart, we wrap it up, we have to uh, have the double plastic gloves, uh, sorry, uh, double wraps, so that we keep the heart uh, cold in ice. And uh, once we have put it in the ice bucket, we rush towards our goal, wherever I mean, we are doing, we come to our hospital. And once we have reached the hosp hospital, there is another team which is working on the patient, or I would say on the donor, or sorry, on the recipient, and uh, that team gets ready. I mean, they open the patient and prepare the patient for, for a transplant. And uh, once the heart reaches in the operation theater, um, you inspect the heart, prepare the heart for, for the transplant. Uh, you see, I mean, you have to really identify the right and the left atrium, SVC and IVC, because when all these, I mean, this is in the chest, in the donor or, or in the recipient, it looks very simple. But when you get heart as a, as I would say, another organ, it, at times becomes a challenge to identify. So before you start swinging it up, you have to really start looking at and find which organ is what and identify that and make your markers according to that. And once the heart uh, I mean, gets anastomosed, I mean, all the, all the anastomosis are being done. So we start from left atrium and, and do the uh, SVC anastomosis at the end. And once this done and the hearts, and we unclamp and the heart starts beating, I mean, it's really a feeling which is very amazing. Although I myself have stopped the heart many times, started the heart of, of a patient, but this feeling is, uh, and I can tell you, is totally different. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manhotra. We'll have probably time for one or two questions from the chair, if there are any. 
So we have done 10 then we cases. We have the chairman's mic on. Uh, and uh, so far, I mean, the last case, the 10th case was done, I think, about a week back, and uh, the patient is doing well. And uh, so far, I think we had one mortality. The rest of the patients are doing well. They are on the follow-up. They are regularly being followed up and have the good results with that. Okay, we'll take up a question from Mr. Talbar. Sir. Well, I just want to, Dr. Rajneesh, uh, mention about the vasculopathy, the complication which is uh, quite well mentioned. The, I mean, I recall our 18 patient, initial 18 patient, which I was very regularly following in AIMS and doing even angiography every year, we did an ultrasound for them. We couldn't find any patient having vasculopathy. I think now as our experience of heart transplant in the country is rising, we should try to look at it because we were not sure what is the reason. Because even some patients who had crossed about uh, eight, nine years of their transplant, even then the coronaries were clean. So uh, whether we are different or that uh, the other reason that we probably had that time we were considering is it our uh, and the, and because we harvest usually from one theater and then transplant to other, that kind of uh, uh, the time period is very short. That, that is protective, or in some way that we, as uh, the race, we are less prone to it. I think now, as we have experience from, I think, Mr. To check with Dr. Balakishan also now what's happening. Because that is one area probably whether we do differ or it was a small experience that we were not seeing. Well, that's a very good idea, sir. We should really look into the patient's uh, Indian data. What is the incidence of vasculopathy? I mean, we have very small, I mean, I would say numbers where we just done 10 cases. But the people who have done more at AIMS and uh, Chennai, we should really ask them if they are, I mean, in, in the, uh, so if they have lost a couple of patients, I mean, they can just look into uh, do the histopathology and see whether, or may do a, I think, a OCT to just to check whether these patients have vasculopathy or not. Okay, it's thank really you, Mr. Manutra. Uh, that's the time that we have for the presentation. Please join the uh, panel. We move on to the Thanks. penultimate lecture. That's on Centrimac and extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. A versatile extracorporeal life support technology. Dr. Kevil Krishan joins us again for the next 12 minutes to deliberate, and uh, following that, three minutes of discussion. Dr. Krishan, please. I'm Dr. Kevil, I'm going to speak on Centrimag and ECMO, which are, we have already spoken about uh, implantable devices, HeartMate 2, 3 and hardware. I'm going to tell just now about uh, emergency placement, like Intermax 1, Intermax 2, what we should be doing for that. As I mentioned in my previous presentation, this uh, Centrimag is a very wonderful uh, extracorporeal ventricular assist device to support for days to weeks. And ECMO, we have been doing a lot for lungs as well as for heart and lung. So, can you? Okay. Can we have the slides, please? Uh, it's not smoke. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, Centrimag is a magnetically levitated secretory pump, and actually, this technology has been used for the HeartMate 3, which is uh, most advanced and with the very, very promising. So, they have put Centrimag as an upside down, and then made the HeartMate 3. So. Uh, this is an ideal pump, simple to use and set up also. Minimal priming volume and connections and atraumatic blood surface, minimal heat generation. Basically, my uh, experience from Mayo Clinic and Mount Sinai, we used to use biomedic as pump and every patient we put on that could not survive. Even my chief resident told he, ha he was there for six years and he never seen a single patient on biomedic as pump surviving and leaving the ICU. Since Centrimac came, a lot of people we could save. That's, that was the difference which I saw at that time. And minimal anticoagulation required and it can be used as a, many centers they use Centrimac as a ECMO also by putting a Jostra oxygenator in the circuit. So it is a magnet, fully magnetically levitated pump as I mentioned. And it has a console, rotor, this uh, pump and the monitor and the monitor display monitor is right and left so it's a uh, you can see bo if, if you put the bivad with the same monitor you can see both the, both of them and you can change the parameters with the same way it's a versatile lightweight transportable pump and you can transfer the patient from centrimac to any place so as uh, it's a polycarbonate pump and uh, indications are left ventricular failure post cardiotomy or transplant graft failure most of the it's most common indication is post transplant when the right heart is not working and the post-LVAD when the right heart is not working. 
right ventricular failure post cardiotomy ventricular failure post alvad myocarditis patients and post infarct show as an ecmo support or as a bridge to decision whether attempt to recovery long term alvad transplant or alvad or transplant these patients centrimac can be used in the kids also and uh, it's as a bridge to another uh, treatment as i mentioned as a bridge to recovery as a bridge to decision or as a bridge to uh, another device or as a bridge to transplant so and these patient can walk depending upon where do you cannulate this uh, device and uh, they can do the exercise on centrimag also it's an adult as well as pediatric as it can be used to act more indications for uh, pediatric population as depends upon uh, where you cannulate it so it becomes you can use it as an ecmo or as a, a right heart support left heart support or biventricular support and it's very good device for the bi biventricular support too centrimag is a centrifugally levitated mag magnetically levitated pump basically but the disadvantage of this pump is whosoever company bought this device they got sold whether it was thoratec whether it was levitronics whether it was sanjutes whosoever bought this device the company got sold as a not a very auspicious for financial reasons so uh, the cannula you can put in the lv apex or in the left atrium uh, through the left atrium into the uh, through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and you can put a graft on the ascending aorta you can directly cannulate with the axillary uh, cannula this angled cannula and it supports 5 to 7 liters of flow and quickly you can put the patient without any problem or you can use it as an ecmo and as a bridge to decision there are a lot of papers in the literature which showed in a cardiogenic shock or as a bridge to recovery or in a as an ecmo it has shown better results uh, or as a rva definitely shown better results in a centrimega centrimega shown a better results for in the right ventricle support whether it's a transplant or it's a post alvad and uh, the only problem you can can create is uh, incorrectly mount the blood pump so that it will not move so every device has its own complications so the patient is asking do you think this stuff is working i haven't experienced any side effects so pump thrombosis or the this oxygenator thrombosis we use it as an ecmo the my next talk is on uh, extra uh, this extra corporeal membrane oxygenation we are doing a lot of ecmos at our center we started a uh, 4 years ago this program and we it's been used as a, i have nothing to disclose uh, it is this is a circuit at the bed side of the patient it's a basically a technique of extra corporeal life support which uses heart lung bypass techniques for days or weeks to support heart lung or both the functions in the intensive care unit it's basically a uh, by a cpp pump which you taken out one pump and you can mobilize and uh, you can change the directions of the cannulas and the, of the pump uh, tubings and stuff so that you can keep it and you can move it anywhere you can transport by air as well as by surface travel at the when the ecmo was started it was used to be used as a oxygenation so people saying it as a coined a term extra corporeal membrane oxygenation then subsequently it was used for carbon dioxide removal and then it was used as a life support so finally the terminology is a uh, extra corporeal life support and uh, this in also is a registry international registry we are part of max is part of the registry um, when the beginning the oxygenator was started it was like a big oxygenator and lot of uh, connections in that but uh, and actually when the ecmo came it used to be from 70 to 90 there are lot big circuit lot of two three perfusionists just on the pump as well as they are running to the blood bank and getting platelet ffp it wasn't actually working and the results of ecmo were very bad and then people stopped using it and again 2001 or 2 they again started with a miniaturized pump and then because you can see the difference between the two which was between 70 to 90s and then then nowadays the circuit is very small less heparinization less blood loss less heat generation less trauma to the it's a biocompatible pump basically and uh, it what we do is take out the venous blood and then put back it uh, that is arterial uh, oxygenated <coughs> blood as i mentioned 
in the, my previous presentation also, when you require lung also, you can use the ECMO, but ECMO can be used only for a few days to weeks. Uh, some centers, those who are regularly doing ECMO, like 100 a year, 200 a year, they keep the circuit ready with the prime that whenever the patient requires it, they just wheel in the, to the patient and then put the IV. We also can put it IV at the shortest time it took to put a patient on ECMO was a 26 minutes from emergency to putting the patient on ECMO. It can be used as cardiac and <coughs> cardiorespiratory and for both the purpose, purpose the, for the cardiac reason is bridge to transplant as end stage after coronary, after any post cardiotomy or myocarditis, decompensated cardiac failure or drug overdose, profound cardiac depression, severe trauma. Uh, it's uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, this uh, Intermax 1, 2 and 3, when you require crash and burn situation, progressive decline or you can use it as an extracorporeal device or the cardiologist can use it as a multi-vessel PCI in the, they put the patient on ECMO and then they do their procedure and then you can take it out. And uh, for the respiratory reasons, uh, ARDS most common, whether it could be because of viral, bacterial or any infection, severe pneumonia, sepsis or as a bridge to lung transplantation or primary graft failure after lung transplantation, aspiration pneumonitis and Wagner's coronavirus, we did on one on Wagner's also. Whenever you are called to put the patient on ECMO, most of the time the X-ray looks like that. It's a complete white with 100% FiO2. All the ventilator parameters are on high end settings and still the oxygenation is not maintained above 70%. And uh, this, uh, this is a configuration of VV ECMO. We put a one femoral cannula to, up to the IVC to close to the IVC RA junction, another in the SVC. We take out the blood from the inferior cannula, uh, lower cannula and put it back after oxygenation. And for VA ECMO, most of the time it's a peripheral ECMO, one in the femoral artery and one in the femoral vein. This is how it looks like bedside. Centrimac can also be made that way. Insertion of ECMO is we do the systemic anticoagulation. We give four, 300 units per uh, more than four, 400 seconds ACT. But after you put the cannulation, you can keep the ACT afterward 160 to 180. And this is our team. Uh, we are putting the ECMO in one of the patients, uh, so fem in the groin as well as in the upper cannula. We used to use T in the beginning because we were not sure of position of the cannula to avoid recirculation. But nowadays we're so much used to this, so we don't use T anymore for to put the cannula in. This is how it looks like when one cannula is in the groin and another is in the neck. And once the X is, as soon as you put the patient, within a minute the saturation goes up to 98-96%. Once the patient becomes better after a few days to weeks, we usually wean the ECMO. The management of ECMO is basically maintain the saturation, in the VA ECMO 100% of uh, saturation, but for the VV ECMO it's a more than 80, it's more than 75 is fine. And mean pressure more than 60, PCO to 35 to 60, all the parameters which we usually keep. Uh, the only difference is that because the 5 liters of blood is flowing outside the body, you need to have a he heat heater unit so that uh, they, it should not get cold and the temperature is usually maintained 30 to 35 to 37. If the patient has fever, we usually deliberately keep 35 degrees centigrade. And if the patient develops any any uh, clot in the oxygenator, then transmembrane pressure increases more than 100. So then you may have to change the oxygenator. And once the pulmonary compliance improves, X-ray improves, we usually wean off the, we don't remove the cannula, we just wean, remove the gas line. And for four hours, if it's okay, then next day, six hours, we remove the gas and then we remove the ECMO. Once the patient is out of ECMO, we put the patient in the couch. Most of the patient, because they are on ventilator for a while, they, they go for tracheostomy. And once uh, they, after the couch, we put the patient, uh, we remove the ventilator and put on the T-piece and then uh, remove the tracheostomy tube. These are few complications. Uh, one is uh, for the Avalon cannula, it's a single cannula put in the neck that uh, can cause thrombosis because of small size. And uh, the another big, the big cannulas which we put from the IVC or SVC, they can also get clotted. And the membrane oxygenator can get clotted depending upon what ACT you keep. 
in the emergency situation if the power outage you can use this as a you can just switch the your pump to on this and which is closed by device kept and then you can crank it so with the, your hand you can physically do it by the time you get complete connections the main is the most important thing for that ECMO is the potentially reversible pulmonary or cardiopulmonary. If it is not reversible like uh, the pulmonary fibrosis, you can't treat those patients uh, uh, with the ECMO because it's of no use. You can use them as a bridge to lung transplant though, but for the recovery it's not possible. And we need, because it's a major undertaking, we need to make sure whether it's uh, either anything to be gained by the conventional treatment. and. It's not, it doesn't mean that if you have ECMO, just keep on putting in everybody, like you have nail, you have hammer, everything looks like nail. Or neurological status also has to be known because you check the neurological status. Most of the patients, they are hypoxic and the hypoxic brain damage. And then even if you put the patient on ECMO, they don't recover. So, and if there is any contraindication to heparin, like a patient has bleeding, GI bleed or cerebral bleed, then you should the key to success of ECMO may be the time of initiation because it's uh, rescue therapy and rescue therapies are meant to be for the dying patient, not the dead patient. So <coughs> we retrieve the patients from elsewhere. So far we have done six surface transfers and one air transfer. And uh, uh, this is our team who went for, to take, the, our, this is our second patient who's surface transfer. The key to success is selection of the right patient, indication, initiation at the right time, utilizing the right disposables and regular practice to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Krishna. We probably will have one question from the chair, if there is any for uh, Dr. Kevin Krishna. Well, I think uh, rather than a question, I will make a comment. The Centrimag as well as the HeartMate 3, I mean, both have got very good results, and I would say both work on the same principle. So that's why I think Centrimac can work almost, I um, mean, I would say, has got excellent result with very low thrombosis rates. And the Centrimac can also work as a temporary or a LV, I can say, for a short period. So both the things are, I would say, uh, as if they are working on the same principle, have got excellent results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Krishnan. Uh, please join us. We move on to the last lecture of this session. That's on non-transplant surgical options and cardiac surgery. I'd like to invite Dr. S. K. Sinha, Director of Cardiothoracic Vascular Surgery at the Max Smart Super Specialty Hospital, Saket, for the next 12 minutes, and then we'll take up three minutes of uh, discussion. Dr. Sinha, over to you. Good evening, everybody. At the end of the session, and probably quite a few of my talk will be major repetitions of whatever already has been spoken. However, I try to summarize, there are quite a few emerging epidemics like heart failure, atrial fibrillation, metabolic syndromes, and as the patient is living for more and more number of years, we'll continue to see all these things. Heart failure, as we all know, is a deteriorating function of the heart with end organ hypoperfusion, which can be diastolic and systolic dysfunctions. A lot has been said, what actually happens is the heart balloons up, or you can say it dilates. And once the heart dilates, you'll see the muscle thins out. And if you leave it for long, the muscle will become absolutely papery thin, as sometimes we see it on the table during surgery. What happens that these patients are difficult subsets when we are operating, whether we are doing valve replacements, whether we are doing coronary artery disease. And all, as Dr. Mani rightly said, that the first step in managing all these things before the heart fails, if there is ischemia, treat the ischemia. The aim of surgical management of congestive heart failure is to bring together the latest clinical, scientific, and investigational surgical approaches to improve the life of this challenging group of patients. The most important is the continuity of care. So what all we have? Repair, remodel, and replace. First is, if you have an ischemia, treat it. Do a proper CABG, the heart will improve. If the mitral valve needs uh, is leaking, it is damaged, repair, or replace. 
then if the heart has become big because of its geometrical or an infarction, then you have to treat that. As CABG has, is important, there is a strong evidence that ischemic cardiomyopathy, if it is related to ischemia, there is a good evidence that there is a lot of hibernating myocardium and it will improve. If the heart is bad, say ejection fraction 20 to 25 percent, 30 percent, if you want to know whether he is going to improve after surgery or not, please do a dobutamine stress or a PET scan. Off pump and on pump should always depend on the surgeon's comfort. Today, as we have got better myocardial preservation techniques, whether you do off pump and in bad hearts, especially big hearts, as Dr. Mani mentioned, a hypertrophic heart, you can do better on pump because if you are trying to do a difficult off-pump surgery, probably you will damage the heart more. The use of off-pump techniques and beating heart surgery have lessened the morbidity and mortality with patients and especially with severe LV dysfunction in marginal patients. Mitral regurgitation, whether we should repair, replace, I am always in favor of replacing mitral regurgitation, especially if they are more than severe. If it is grade two, 2 to grade 3, normally I would leave that mitral regurgitation because once you improve the cardiac function, these mitral regurgitations come down. Now coming to the another subset which was at one time very common is dynamic cardiomyoplasty. The latissimus dorsi muscle was wrapped around the heart and this muscle will assist in improving the contractility of the heart. But probably nowadays it's not being done because we have got much better alternatives for that. The other thing is when you have an aneurysm of the heart, what you do, you reconstruct it, open the heart, put a teflon felt, cross it, cut out the extra portion and that will improve the function of the heart because then you don't have an area which has an asynchronous contraction in the heart. Another device which came into being was wrapping a, a corn device. It's a, actually a polyester jacket which used to be wrapped around the myocardium so that it doesn't dilate. Another area where the cardiologists uh, have done great wonders is resynchronization therapy. And everybody knows, and we had a discussion in the morning about CRT and CRTD. The basic principle, as we all know, is pacing both the ventricles and making them synchronous. ECMO has been talked in detail in the previous, do doctor, in the previous lecture. Dr. Kewal has done a great job of that. One thing we, what I would like to add is that we all know that it is very interesting concept and you can support it for next two to three weeks using an ECMO support and we have had quite good salvages. But still, though this was started for cardiac patients, nowadays, if you see a lot of our patients are respiratory patients and probably the best results come in these respiratory patients. A patient of H1N1, patient of ARDS, these are the patients which probably as of today are benefiting much more than this wonderful technology. Various centers are doing it. The, it, it has been miniaturized so that it can be just put on the bed and hooked to it. Nowadays, it doesn't take much of space as it was uh, previously. One thing is important is that when you are putting a VA ECMO, from the femoral side, your distal limb ischemia becomes a problem and that is why you have to use a distal perfusion catheter so that it doesn't uh, create that problem.
as he rightly said that we can now transport patients on the ambulance on the helicopters the patient can be mobile very fast as you see here because all these are technology miniaturization of things and the care and the experience what one has gathered over the years so as of today uh, ecmo is an important adjunct in all advanced icus where cardiac and respiratory failures are there now ventricular assist devices ventricular assist devices nowadays whether it is a destination therapy or a bridge to transplant both can be used it can be used as a bridge to recovery a bridge to transplant transplantation or a destination therapy the two year survival was 25% in patients with ventricular assist devices improved survival 50% at 12 months and 35% at 24 months another very important aspect which is in the experimental and probably a very this thing is stem cell therapy the stem cell transplantation either combined with cabg or as such is again becoming a reality previously what they used to do is to punch out holes and put stem cell in the form of what bone marrow from the bone marrow they used to take it and centrifuge it take the stem cells and put it in the myocardium so it is concentrated put in the myocardium so that the ischemic area the scarred areas and all have a regeneration of the myocardium the cells the muscle regenerates and probably it will improve the ejection fraction however much has to be seen whether really it is going to be of benefit or not total heart artificial heart another very interesting area of research the jarvik heart which is has got both pumps left ventricular pump and the right ventricular pump completely being formed of elastic polyurethane couplers 2.5 lakhs again Sorry. how much is Sorry. going to be there it is going to be a reality because still it is not But yet come as heart med 3 which has come as a destination therapy or a transplantation so it can be a future alternative to transplant this is exactly how it looks there are two pumps and they work as left and vent, uh, right ventricles this is how it is implanted laser tmlr on all these are there so what do we have we should have all the armamentariums we should have a ecmo team we should standardize protocols patient selection is important regular practice should be there thank you uh, thank you dr sinha we'll have probably one or two questions from the chairman dr sinha if you could please take your uh, seat and probably now we'll have 5 yeah. to 7 minutes for the comments from yeah. the chair yeah. as we are done with all the lectures any questions from the floor regarding all the topics we had dr lapor you would like to join us like if uh, lvad is poor like you mentioned about giving anticoagulation do you think aspirin is also required in a patient who is not a ischemic heart disease like if you have dilated cardiomyopathy does that patient require aspirin in addition to the anticoagulation so there were many studies which have been done and they have found that if we give uh, aspirin along with uh, acetrom or warfarin the uh, incidence of pump thrombosis is less i think so many many people recommend that we should be giving as aspirin for these patients i would like to have uh, yeah. dr lapos comment dr lapos cmp or you are asking for elvad no, elvad elvad you require acosprin 150 or 110 mg per day and acetrom because the people they started using only acosprin or they, there were some trials or low threshold for inr 1.611 the pump thrombosis rate increased in heart med 
So Echosprint plus uh, Acetron. Uh, a question from Dr. Lapore. Uh, how, f as Dr. Sina mentioned about total artificial heart. So how far away f we are pra uh, realizing it in practicality that we will be having a total artificial heart implanting at our center like maths? I mean, total no, artificial heart, how real it can be and how soon? Well, it, it's, it's very, very uh, expensive. <laughs> it's very expensive anyway. But that's always the first question in India, I must say. Uh, the thing is, artificial heart exists even longer than fats, or almost longer than fats. Jarvik uh, 8, uh, uh, Jarvik 7 actually became uh, the, uh, the, what is it called now, Syncardia. It is in, indeed very effective. The only problem is that uh, it's pneumatic. Uh, so now uh, we have the Carmat in, uh, in France, which is a very elegant design. Uh, it's not pneumatic, it's electric driven. So we have to wait. We have to wait until uh, they come up with uh, their uh, final results. So if you look over the years, it took them a very, very, very long to reach that point. And in reality, there are still not many artificial hearts uh, implanted. And I think it's also a psychological factor. For a patient, it's uh, really dreadful to have a total artificial heart uh, and knowing that if there will be a mechanical failure and we have to realize all uh, devices has still have failures, that it's immediately the end. And with VATS, even with bivats, uh, then there is always the native heart who can take over and patients have at least the feeling that they can survive. So it is realistic, we will see it in the future but it takes much longer than what we see with uh, the, uh, the, the development of VET implantations. Thank you. But this carmet has been put in uh, animals and animal studies, they have, animal has survived for three months. If I, if I mean you may correct me. So three months of animal has already survived on a total mechanical heart. So it's very much a possibility, it's not that it will, but as the computers and everything are miniaturizing, so maybe in near future, maybe five years from now or ten years from now, we can see a total mechanical heart. And people saw the alternative method is putting a biventricular cyst device, but the results of biventricular cyst device are not very encouraging. Australian people use almost 40 biventricular cyst device, and 40 percent of them couldn't leave the hospital. So it's, it's not very good option putting. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So it was a very interesting session. A lot of people they took interest and in, they were involved. All the audience were involved in this. So I'm thankful to everybody, all the speakers and the audience. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'd like to thank all the chairpersons, moderators.